Uh, we get to Mandy Gunasakara, uh, and she is with us, the former EPA chief of staff under the Trump administration. My goodness gracious, so many things going on. Mandy, good morning to you. How are you? Thank you for joining us. I'm good, Paul. Yeah, great to be I with can't you. Hear you. Right. There we go. Discuss. Now I can hear you. Yes, oh, we do. I'll Where say do it again. Start? Good morning. For, <laughs> good morning. Um, this natural gas thing, we, it was kind of bubbling out, and they, had, you know, he's, he was attacking the appliances. Now it's it's a full frontal assault on on this. And from your perspective, behind your desk uh, in Washington D.C., handling these matters, is it inconsequential? Should we be worried about this? It's a great idea. Is it killing the uh, 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 the people out there needlessly? What's your take on this? Yeah, it's a terrible idea, and it's a continuation of the war on fossil fuels we've seen from day one of this administration. You talked extensively about it, and I know your listeners are very familiar with the cancellation of the Keystone XL pipeline, but that really mm -hmm. set the stage with how this administration was going to approach our most important energy resources, coal, oil, and natural gas that provide over 80% of the domestic energy that we use um, on a day-to-day -day basis. Now let's talk about our allies abroad. The biggest problem with potentially banning the export development of LNG is our allies abroad. You hear Biden talk all the time about he's a huge advocate for helping Ukraine and the war against Russia and other allies. But the worst thing he could do is cut off supply to an energy resource that uh, prevents them from having to rely on Vladimir Putin to provide them the energy resources that they otherwise need. So. Look, here's the truth is, this is within the purview of the Department of Energy. Um, folks should understand to export LNG in this country, you have to get two, generally speaking, permit approvals. One comes from FERC um, and the other one comes from the Department of Energy. FERC is mostly the construction, the siding, the, the hardware, if you will. And DOE approves the movement of the molecules outside uh, the border of the United States. And so in that approval, there's a provision where Department of Energy can assess whether or not this action is in the quote, public interest. It's obviously in the public interest to export an energy resource of which we have an abundant amount. We know how to extract, refine, and deliver in a very efficient market. It's good for the local economy, it's good for the workers, and then it mm. helps our allies ab abroad push back against crazy people like Vladimir Putin um, and even China that will use energy as a geopolitical weapon. So it's a terrible but, idea across the board. Mandy, I haven't seen too many studies or, or news reports where uh, natural gas is that much of a pollutant. It, has, it hasn't it has been on the forefront like coal, so it, it, it's catching a lot of people off guard. It is also a situation where uh, it's almost similar to the Keystone Pipeline when he killed that. All of that... Uh, uh, supply had to be shipped uh, in either trains or on on the roads with uh, trucks. So you you actually did more damage. In this particular case, it's the same thing if you had to convert over to coal to make up the difference in here. So yeah, well, at, what, what, at, what point at, at his, that key, Paul? Yeah, at, at at his physical mental level, here's what I gotta wonder. There are a lot of people close to him know that he's gone more so than we do. And he's making these irrational decisions. Now, wouldn't you think that people who are so-called pulling his strings will say, Mr. President, you can't do this for this reason. And he, he goes over on, in some type of tantrum, and then they let him do it. So it's got to be something more sinister than just him. Yeah, it's... look. President Biden is not calling the shots on much of anything. No. It is the staff around him. And uh, they are some of the most extreme anti-development activists um, that, that I've ever engaged with in my career working in, in, on the U.S. Senate and the House and then obviously in the administration. Mm -hmm. And you have people like John Podesta. He's, the, he's a senior advisor at the White House, something along those lines. He is pushing an outright ban on natural gas. And I just want to make one point. There's been a couple of studies on the on the environmental claims about natural gas. Um, we lead the world in overall emissions reductions. However, you want to 
measure yeah. that from clean air, um, pollutants in water, and then to global greenhouse gas emissions because of our expansion in natural gas. And there's one study, it was put out by the National Energy Technology Lab a couple years ago, but it compared U.S. LNG delivered to Europe and Asian markets compared to Russian um, natural gas. And the U.S. is 41% cleaner when delivered in European markets, 47% cleaner when delivered wow. to Asian markets. So if you do care about the environment, then you want more U.S. LNG. But that's just a red herring for this administration that wants to shut down this yep. industry because they've put all their eggs in the renewable energy basket. Uh, and I do, I, it kind of hits us too because I think, don't we have a lot of that supply off the coast in, in some places? in Mississippi? Oh, yeah, it's huge for Mississippi. I mean, I grew up in Decatur, Mississippi, and um, this is still pretty much the case, at least in the summer. A lot of my high mm -hmm. school friends would go down and work offshore because you could, you, it's a good paying job. Um, and yeah, you work hard hours when you're out there, but it tends to, tended to be two weeks on, two weeks off. So it works for a lot of people. Um, it creates immense local opportunities all throughout the Southeast, but I've seen it firsthand in Decatur, Mississippi. Yeah. Let me let me play this one. I think this was yesterday. Um, so the Department of Energy has finalized a rule for energy savings uh, standards on appliances like refrigerators, washing machines, wine beverage chillers, freezers, clothes dryers, dishwashers, electric gas, and stovetops. So is our kitchen one of the root causes that's killing the environment? Uh, altogether, the uh, energy efficiency standards advanced by this administration will provide nearly one trillion dollars in consumer savings. But, but the standards, the effects of the standards outweigh the cost. So look, we're talking about making sure that these these products are efficient. One other big benefit, as I just laid out, is making sure that we're saving Americans money. I think that's important. Yeah. That's important that we're, we, we're able to do that. $1.6 billion over uh, 30 years, that's what Americans want to see. Wait a minute, even $1.6 billion, $1.6 billion over 30, over 30 years? Oh, uh, they just how do you lie, that? Paul. They lie. God, geez, they, <laughs> they, they pick, they here, pick they, a number. They, Here's they, a number. Pick a number. Here. Right. Uh, but that's if this it. administration cared so much about saving Americans money, they would start by getting inflation under control. They would stop rampant government spending, um, and they would want to encourage more energy development here in the U.S. because when you have higher production, there's downward pressure on mm -hmm. prices, and that trickles down to the consumers, which we all benefit from. Did you ever run into um, Ali uh, Zaidi, Z-A-I-D-I? -I. He's a Pakistani-American lawyer, political advisor, serving the second White House National Climate Advisor since 2022. You, you know this guy? I do. I'm from the, I, I believe, if I'm correct, I believe he worked at EPA in the Biden administration. Um, yeah, he, he's I, I a Harvard. The same individual. He, he's a Harvard lawyer. He's he's not even a weatherman or doesn't have even a meteorology degree. I'm not sure exactly why he's uh, as far as climate's concerned. Here he goes. Can you share the amount of greenhouse gas emissions that this rule would cut in the short term? That's a really. I think that's part of what this uh, review is all about, is to understand what are the implications of LNG. Um, we've started to learn more about leakage rates at different parts of the supply chain. I'll let you handle that one. That's all, it's all yours. <laughs> this, Go ahead. This guy's, he's so smart. He lacks common sense, Paul. Um, that's when, yeah. that's, it's, it's, it's crazy. When I was at EPA, we did significant analysis on the natural gas industry. We had two major packets, a, te a methane technical package and then policy package. But at the end of the day, and people who, who ascribe to common sense understand that if you're developing natural gas, the gas itself is the commodity. You don't want to lose that along the way. Um, and, and so there is this built-in incentive to ensure that there is no actual leakage throughout the supply chain. Now, do some emissions mm -hmm. get out? Yes, of course. But the technologies that are available today, even compared to just five, six years ago, it's pretty amazing. And I will reiterate this. U.S. oil and gas operators have the most efficient process for extracting, refining, and, refining yep. and delivering energy resources we all need to any market. I want to talk. I want to talk more about it on the other side of this break. We've got a break coming up. It was like Joe Biden talking about all these people who were fired from the Keystone Pipeline are going to be able to go out and, and cap these wells. We 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 thought maybe they would have taken care of it. That didn't materialize either. More with man. 
So 32 oil and natural gas uh, industry groups have signed on to a letter saying that the pause sends a wrong message to the allies, but also that it will push countries specifically in Asia to turn to coal plants when they can't get that increased uh, LNG, you know, which we've seen in India, China, Bangladesh, Vietnam, Pakistan, Germany, when they couldn't find enough natural gas. So what's your response to that, Chris? You know, we can we can sort of go through where different groups are, um, and that's exactly that's exactly what the Department of Energy process is all about. But does the pause then push other countries towards coal? That I don't think that bears out uh, in fact. Oh, really? Um, why wouldn't you think it bears out in fact when they've done it? They said that they have to do it. Um, it is I, amazing. <laughs> your your thoughts? Yeah. Yeah, well, it's it's so interesting that he he needs to go through a process to know what we already know, and it is yeah. it is very true. So in China, I was looking at the numbers. I think it's it's three hundred two or three hundred five coal plants that they have announced um, are either in the process or will build out over the next few years. This is the largest expansion in the entire globe. And I'll tell you this, Paul, the coal plants that they're building in China, they don't use pollution control technology that our guys and gals that are in the coal industry have been using for years. So mm -hmm. that's why when you go to China, um, they've been wearing masks for a long time, and it's not because of COVID or anything like that. It's because their particulates in the air are so bad because they go cheap on pollution, traditional pollution control equipment when it comes to the type of coal plants that they're actually yeah. building. There are a lot of people, and we just need more to understand what's going on behind the scenes here. With, with this, with this uh, interview and the transcribed interview with the House Oversight Committee, that happened, I think it was last Friday, Rob Walker, Rob was a, a Hunter Biden associate. And, and that story is, it, it, we talk about Ukraine and, and the, the corruption there. But the story was that there's a growing body of evidence that Hunter's work with a Chinese energy company started years before that million dollar payment that began to flow into the Biden family coffers back in 2017, following the time that Joe Biden left office as vice president. So we have no idea what the corruption is back there, but there are deals to be cut or that are being cut that don't seem to be good for America, but good for China. This whole EV deal, your thoughts on that? Well, yeah, I, I'd say two things. Um, the, the Team Biden has prioritized the benefit of the Biden family or the Biden crime family as mm -hmm. our oversight guys in the House GOP have laid out quite clearly. They've prioritized personal benefit over doing what is right by this country in so many different instances. And what we do know about the whole Hunter Biden situation is that we, the American people, have been lied to about that from the very first uttering or the very first question around that. But to your point on China and electric vehicles, yes, when you start diminishing the role of homegrown oil and gas, um, even mining uh, for minerals that go into batteries, there's a huge deposits of the minerals that are needed to go into anything electrified, including advanced vehicle batteries up in our uh, extreme northwest, and, or sorry, northeast. But the Biden administration yeah. has been canceling the mining of those minerals as well. So all this plays into and benefits China. They own the international minerals market when it comes to EV um, develop, battery development and sending those over here. So it, it makes zero sense. But, you know, remember when Keystone XL pipeline was being canceled in the United States, Team Biden was green lighting the Nord Stream 2 pipeline in Russia. So again, from day one, they prioritize energy development yeah. in foreign countries over expanding energy development. That's good for everyone, however you want to measure it here in this country. We were talking to, to, to uh, Professor Glenn and Tizzo a few moments ago, and he says, why are they letting all of these illegals into this country? And every answer goes back to a voter base that they're losing now. And we understand that. I think the greater question is, and we don't hear enough about what Republicans are doing at ground level, to stop this through the courts, or is there a way to stop this? We know that the powers that are given the states, and certainly they don't need every, they don't need Alabama, they don't need Mississippi, they need several key blue states, and they need to flood them with illegals. They need to vote again, and they need to fix the election again, and everything is fine, and Joe Biden's going to win again. How do we stop that? How can you stop that from 
the local courts all the way up to the Supreme Court. Yeah, well, I think the, the type of action that Greg Abbott is taking in Texas is a testament to what states can actually do. You can force you can force the issue. But the truth is, Paul, mm-hmm. it, President Biden has all the tools at his disposal. He could literally sign a piece of paper today that does a few key things that would stem the tide of illegals crossing into this country. So this whole discussion about Team Biden saying that, oh, well, the House Republicans need to do something on immigration for this to stop. That is such a fool's errand to go down and even have that conversation because it's not true. But you're very right to point out this is this is election fraud at its finest. Um, The other side likes to talk about election integrity um, and push back on election fraud fraud, but encouraging illegal immigrants to come in and make it easier for them to vote in local districts, just just leading up to a presidential election. Um, it, it It is a major issue. And what's going to be really important, and I will say this, um, I know that the the various Republican organizations, including the RNC, but then um, some elections on their own and the Trump campaign have been focusing on how do we get Uh, voters to come out and vote in support of the conservative vision and our candidates like President Trump well before just the day of voting. And and we've got to play the same game in in terms of not just going after votes, but going after ballots as well. Um, Because if we don't play this game with the new rules that have been set, we will be continually delivered losses. As far as this negotiation with a a bipartisan support for a new border deal, um, I know it sounds childish and bizarre, but we are in a bizarre world. What the president is basically saying, and this sounds simplistic, but I want you to give me a deal that allows me to do everything I'm doing, and then we'll call it bipartisan, and then I will sign it. Because everything on there, he wants more border patrol down there, not to stop it, but to process them. So... Of course, Mike Johnson and everybody else is not going to fall for this stuff. And I don't, you know, if they did, they'd be in trouble. Yeah, and they should be in trouble. The voters need to hold our members accountable. But they've been they've been playing this right. Biden's trying to play politics with our border. We all know that it's open in its course, mainly because he did away with some key Trump administration policies that he could simply he could reinstate with a signature. This is remain in Mexico. This is ending catch and release. And he could finish the border wall that President Trump started. The resources are there. And I'll tell you this too, Paul, you know, my husband was, he worked at Customs and Border Protection and was head of policy during the Trump administration. And he keeps in touch with a lot of the Border Patrol agents and groups that are down there. They are ready, willing, and able to do their job, which is to secure the border of this country. But it's the president who is standing in the way and telling them, no, don't stop the illegals. I want you to facilitate them coming into this country. Um, I think we also know that by the vast majority of uh, Border Patrol and National Guard people, they're of one mind down there. They don't want to be fighting each other, and, and, and none yeah. of them like what's going on as far as on the border. Kirby Kirby has done about as bad a job as KJP. President Biden talked about shutting down the border on the basis of national security. Are there not steps that he could use under executive authority to some measures uh, to kind of seal some of the border efforts? He, he has said he's he's willing to use executive measures, and um, and you know if he gets if he gets the the bill passed, if he gets border funding, um, and and it and includes those authorities. He'll use those authorities. Why, not, why wait? Why wait till Congress? Why not? We need we need we need legislative support for border security measures, and uh, we need the funding to be able to put in place border security measures that the president can utilize. He has done some things, like putting uh, uh, U.S. troops down there to alleviate some of the responsibilities or administrative responsibilities of border patrol. Um, and but but we need this we need this funding. I think if you went to an insane asylum and picked out everybody there to run the country, it wouldn't be much difference than what's going on now. Your final thoughts, Mandy. Yeah, I, I reiterate my other earlier point when you played clips from the spokesman of this administration, the Biden administration, they just straight up lie. Uh, they lie mm-hmm. and, and they are running away from the truth and facts that we all know. We don't need a process to know that LNG is good for this country, it's good for the environment, and it's good for our allies abroad. Just like we don't need a process in Congress to give Biden resources and authority that he already has. I was on the tip of my tongue. I wish that reporter had asked, what authority was it that President Trump had to 
create a stable situation along the border that President Biden purportedly no longer has? That would have been a very interesting question, but yeah. the easiest job in this world is to be a Democrat communications uh, person because you, you, just get to, <laughs> you just get to parrot the talking points and no one's going to check you on it. That's exactly right. Mandy, always a pleasure. Thank you so very much for spending the time with us. Mandy yeah, Gunasakara and...